So if this isn't a legit message from the other side, I'm not sure what is. I don't even know where to start this story. So I guess I'll just start at the beginning. Here it goes. I met the love of my life in 1996 when I was 16 years old. For privacy reasons, we'll call him John. He was my first love and in many ways, the only love I've never ever known. Fast forward 20 years and Though we hadn't spoken much and were both married to other people, I could honestly say that I was still head over heels for this guy. Unfortunately, he passed away from cancer a few years back and the loss was devastating to say the least. I can't get into all of the details, but suffice to say, John's death robbed me of any hope that I would ever experience real love like that over again. I could go on and on about this, but I'll skip ahead to the interesting part. A few weeks ago, I was going through a box where I keep pictures, letters, and other things that remind me of John and all of the experiences we shared. I found a letter I wrote to him after he died that I had completely forgotten about. In the letter, I asked him to show me a sign that he was still around and still with me. I told him that I needed to be a big sign, one that couldn't be mistaken for anything else. Not a flickering light or simple coincidence. I needed a big, real, unmistakable sign. So I looked up and said out loud, John, I'm still looking for that sign. Well, a few days later, I got a text from my mother. She sent me a picture of an envelope, a junk mail advertisement from a local insurance company. She had received three of these advertisements that day, one addressed to her, another to my father, and a third addressed to John's father. Now, John's parents live in the same city as my parents, but they do not live near each other. According to Google Maps, it's a two mile, six minute drive between their houses. There's a major thoroughfare that divides the city and my parents live on one side, his parents on the other. Their addresses are not even close to being similar, so that couldn't have accounted for the mix up. Both of our families' last names are unusual and uncommon and are not spelled or pronounced the same in any way. My parents and his parents are not friends. They do not belong to the same clubs or churches. I don't even think they're Facebook friends. So how in God's name did a letter addressed to John's father end up in my parents' mailbox? The town they live in has a population of about 30,000. What are the chances that this letter that was supposed to be delivered two miles away ended up in the wrong mailbox? A mailbox that just so happens to belong to my parents. I asked for a sign. He gave me one, right? I mean, I suppose it's possible that the letters got stuck together somehow, as they were being sorted, but how? They were not stuck together when my mother found them in the mailbox. And in any case, what are the odds that John's dad's letter would somehow get stuck to one of my parents' letters, out of all the other thousands of letters it was being sorted with? I used to live in a house with my parents, which both myself and my parents had very strange experiences in. However, my parents didn't let me know they had them as they didn't want to spook me further. My room was particularly bad with the activities that used to happen all the time. Just to name a few experiences, there was someone knocking on my door saying my name when everyone else was asleep. My guitar plectrum was thrown at me from across the room and my guitar was often strung or six strings, all at the same time. Obviously, if a string goes out of tune sometimes, one will strum, but all six, definitely no accident. Anyway, I've had this antique mirror for as long as I could remember. It was a past relative, and I always used to notice handprints and fingerprints on it, even though I never touched it that much. They were everywhere from top to bottom. My parents, obviously not wanting to let me know they were also aware of the paranormal things going on, said to me not to worry, and it probably was me touching it by mistake, etc. And they seemed so sure this was the case. I forced myself to not think about it and carry on, as if nothing weird was happening, which was very hard, but something was definitely going on. Eventually, my mum told me she was also concerned about my mirror and needed to speak to me about something she'd seen other than handprints. She never showed me the photo she took because she didn't want to scare me. But she said in the prints on the mirror 
was a perfect face of a devil. She showed my dad and his friend this before, taking a photo. And despite them not wanting to believe in this side of things, they both could see it too. Obviously, I didn't know how to react and thought perhaps something was after me. I mean, who knows? Mum decided to get some advice, so she went to a shop near me called Spellbound. They sold things of all types, but mainly they were all to do with the supernatural type of things and healing crystals, etc. As you can imagine, the people who worked there all were very aware of the spiritual world and different types of paranormal experiences. So my mum felt this was the best place to get advice. She spoke to a guy there about my mirror, who said we had a few options, which were smashing the mirror completely to get rid of any negative energy, moving the mirror away from reflecting onto me, sleeping in my bed, sage the room, or for me to wear a black tourmaline either in a necklace or bracelet form to help protect me. I wasn't worried if we needed to smash the mirror, as I was pretty terrified by this point. However, my parents didn't want to do this, as it used to belong to one of my relatives who wasn't with us anymore. So my mum bought me the black tourmaline and we went on from there. I still noticed the fingerprints and handprints, but not so many strange experiences, so I felt perhaps the tourmaline worked. Mum did go back to Spellbound and spoke to the same guy again, regarding that she thinks the tourmaline worked, but there's still handprints where he said again it might just be worth smashing the mirror. He began to explain how mirrors could be portals for demons or another life, and by keeping the mirror, we could potentially be letting them directly into my room. It's extremely dangerous. My parents still did not want to smash the mirror, typical. So I ended up taking it with me when I moved out a few months later, with every intention to smash it in my own time without them knowing. Well, when I first moved in, I did use it now and then to get changed, etc. While I looked for a new mirror, I was skint, but I would hang a towel over it when I wasn't using it. Anyways, one day, my boyfriend put it up a bit higher in the bathroom to shave or something, I don't know, and he made sure it was secured so it had no way of falling. I put it in the same position before, and I can literally 99.99% tell you it could not fall. Well, as you can probably tell, it did. He left it for literally a few seconds to grab a towel, and within that time, there was a huge bang and then a smash. The mirror had literally shattered into tiny pieces, like even if I wanted to repair it, which I definitely didn't, there would have been no possible way. To this day, I believe that some sort of guardian angel or fate broke that mirror, because as soon as I moved in with the mirror, the flat felt uneasy, and as soon as we disposed of it, I felt so much better living there. Whether whatever was attached to the mirror followed me to the flat when I looked, took it, I don't know. But nevertheless, I'm so glad I'm not dealing with that anymore. It was summer, and I was too sick for summer school that year. So one day, my grandma arranged for me to go to my friend's house across the street the next afternoon. And I was to stay at her house the night before, so I didn't have to spend all day by myself at my own house or have my mom drive me in the morning. It was the year 2000 and I had a great night with my grandma. We played cards and talked and did beads and embroidery all night. Then we went to bed like any other night. We had a sleepover. I would stay with her during the weekend sometimes, but this particular night she had to leave for work the next morning. I was a big girl and I was ready to have a half day alone. So anyway, I got up and had breakfast that morning with my grandma before she went to work at 6am. She told me to have a good day and to not get into trouble, like she did every other time we parted ways. I told her to do the same and then she said she would call and wake me up later in case I fell asleep. It was a little early when she left, so I took a nap on her couch thinking if I went back to bed, I'd sleep all day and not make it to my friend's house in time for lunch. I was a wee thing and could not have made myself lunch, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't too comfortable. A while after falling asleep, or so I thought, I felt my blanket fall off me and it was cold. So cold that I shot up thinking something was wrong. 
Realizing a few seconds later just where I was, the world slowed, and about halfway through sitting the rest of the way up, a wave of nausea and bone-deep chills hit me as fast as they would fade. I see some movements across the room and quickly go to put on my glasses to see who was home. Excited that it might be my grandpa home from driving the truck, I fumbled a bit. I find my glasses, put them on, and realize it's still dark outside. I look around. All the lights are on in the living room where I was sleeping, and the ones in my grandma and grandpa's room down the hall were on as well. I don't remember turning them on, but the one next to the couch. I then think for sure Papa is home and call out for him as I walk towards the bedroom. No answer. Not a problem. He has a hard time hearing from driving trucks. I take another step and chills and nausea waves rush over me once more as I notice a dial tone on the phone in the bedroom. Suddenly sick to my stomach, I take a hard left before the bedroom into the bathroom, like an instinct, right before throwing up, barely making it to the toilet before vomit erupts out of me like a science experiment gone rogue. A minute later, the nausea spikes and drops as the heat returns to the room, following the figure as it crosses past the open bathroom door, with me kneeling in front of the toilet. I'm peering out the corner of my eye, pretending I didn't see a thing, increasingly tensing up. When it passes fully, I collapse and sit down, waiting for the nausea to pass before venturing out of my current known safe zone. Bang! I hear the door close and the dial tone go from a buzz in a distant room, to being so loud my little self was willing to go and hang it back up, no matter what was going on. I leave the bathroom and go into the bedroom, where the blankets on my grandma's side of the bed were folded open, almost too perfectly, for it to have been done by her, and atop the covers the phone lay with the line open. The hairs on my back stood up as I grabbed the phone to hang it up. I'm not too scared to be by myself in their house, and with the sun finally coming up, I'm thinking it's 7.30 or so. I left the house and sat outside until grandma called later on, around nine, to wake me up. I pretended to be just waking up, not realising I was sitting outside, grasping the garage phone in my hand, increasingly tightly for the last hour and a half. I can't recall ever telling anyone besides a school friend once about this, let alone my grandmother, for fear that she might not feel safe at home alone without us during the week. I'll never know if it was a home invader or just built. The next door neighbour coming to grab something and I startled him, so we just left without a word. I may have been the mind of an anemic child riding the line of life and death, or a ghost. I would flatline a week or so later at the hospital from blood loss due to my illness, so who knows? The reaper might have had his schedule off and came for me the wrong day, so he just let himself back out the way he came. Who's to say for sure? My latest experience was pretty tame. I was hanging out with a few friends in between some buildings, where people park their cars, where some storage buildings and a football pitch are located. That's a pretty old area in my city, mostly populated with old people. When we were getting ready to head out, I looked up to one of the storage sheds and saw a pure, white, wispy figure with no discernible features, about 160 centimeters tall kind of hovering five centimetres above the shed's roof. It looked as if it had a cloak over it, as if it was a solid mass, but at the same time, translucent. After I double take it, it fades away rapidly, as is taken by the wind. It was late at night, and I might have been high, weed, but not enough to hallucinate such thing. My other occurrence was when I was a little kid. Might have been six years or ten years, honestly don't remember. This one is not tame at all, and it was pretty scary. So much so that I feel obligated to share. I was in my house going from my bedroom to the kitchen to get something. I turned on the light to the hallway, where to my right would be the living room. We had one of those big ass plasma TV that weighed a ton. The light from the hallway was just enough to illuminate the living room enough to tell pretty confidently what was going on in there. 
I first heard some scurried steps coming from there. I couldn't tell the source. At this point, I had just taken my first step into the hallway. I then hear some giggling. I look over and see a small girl. She was looking at me as I had just come in full view of the living room. She had pigtails and was wearing a dress. I think it was black. I just freeze and stare at her. She now quietly heads over to the TV and hides behind it. When our eye contact stopped, I just ran into my bedroom and hid beneath the covers. I've had minor experiences all my life until the time where I stopped being afraid of the dark. I would hear my name being shouted either on the streets or at home. I would see things move as if there were an air current, like tissues or plants. Bed sheets being tugged on, breath on my face while trying to fall asleep. But one day out of nowhere, I stopped being afraid of the dark, not by choice. I just woke up and I was no longer afraid. When I was four years old, my great-grandma died. I remember her a little bit. I remember, I remember finding out she passed, but I was four at the time. I don't think I was ever told this until I was older, but after my great-grandma died, dimes started showing up, randomly. My family members would find them in random places. I don't remember this as I was very young. My great-aunt, who is one of my grandma's sisters and one of my great-grandma's daughters, apparently after my uncle got in a car accident, she checked the road where it was and everything, and there were dimes on the road where the car crashed. Just dimes. When I was eight, my mom's brother, my uncle, passed away. I was eight, so I remember all of it, but I wasn't super upset by it. Don't get me wrong, I was still really sad I lost my uncle, but I was never like crying about it until recently. After finding out what happened, I've been upset. But this isn't about how he died. Now after he passed, pennies started showing up randomly. My mom would find pennies under her pillow, which doesn't even make sense because she doesn't keep coins in her pocket or near her bed whatsoever. Then as I got older, I started finding both dimes and pennies myself in odd places. I was 10. It was summertime. My older cousin who lives in another state just had twins. And they're my grandparents' first great-grandchildren. So they went to see my cousin, his wife and the kids. My grandparents have a dog though, so me and my mom decided to stay at my grandparents' house while they're gone to look after the dog. We didn't stay there all night and all day, but we'd sleep there and stay for little bits during the day. There wasn't much to do, so one night, we decided to play Monopoly. We set it all up right there, and then the dog wanted to go outside, so we took her outside. When we got back, on the Monopoly board was a dime and a penny. We didn't put them there. No one else was in the house while we were gone. Like I found dimes on the seats of where I sit on the school bus, and I'll say that my great grandma left it for me, but realistically, someone else was sitting there and it fell out of their pocket. But still, why specifically a dime? Same thing when I find the pennies most of the time. But finding both a dime and a penny on the Monopoly board doesn't make sense when they weren't there before we went outside. Also, my grandparents' house is old. My great-grandparents lived there with my grandma and her siblings. Then my grandparents lived there with my mom and her siblings. So my great-grandma did live there at one time, and so did my uncle. And sometimes I'll even hear footsteps upstairs there when no one is upstairs and the footsteps are coming from my uncle's room. I still don't have an explanation for what happened. That was a few years ago and I still think about it how the coins got there. Recently, my uncle's death has been really upsetting me. Last Saturday night, a lot of things were upsetting me, my uncle's death being one of them. With all that, I was crying. The next morning we were going somewhere as a family and it was going to be a long car ride. So just in case I got really bored, I grabbed a book. When I grabbed the book, a penny came out of it. I haven't touched that book in months. I never put coins in it. I was legitimately crying about my uncle's death the night before. And then that happened.
This all would have taken place roughly 10 to 11 years ago, over a period of two years. We had moved into this older house in Abu Dhabi, UAE, after living in another house in the city for two years. It was a creepy house, very normal and in a pretty populated area that was gaining more popularity. The house was quite old, built well on the outside and made from concrete, but was showing its age on the inside. I never felt anything weird about the house, just annoyed at how often a pipe would leak or paints would need to be touched up. However, I very vividly remember two moments in that house. First, I was sleeping in my sister's room with my sister and mother. I must have been around 10 years old, with my sister being five. I didn't like sleeping alone and neither did my sister, so we often shared rooms with our parents. I remember randomly waking up in the middle of the night, no idea why, and after a few minutes of lying there awake, I heard a surprisingly loud female scream. It scared me. I woke my mother and said, did you hear the scream? To which she responded, it was probably just the cats. There were many stray cats that lived in the area, but I knew it wasn't a cat. It sounded like a woman screaming briefly and definitely sounded as if it came from inside the house. And it wasn't our cat because he was asleep with my dad. I eventually fell asleep again and didn't bring it up again, never finding out what it was. Secondly, one night I was lying in bed with my dad, my mom in another room with my sister. I was trying to fall asleep and my dad was reading a book. We then both heard what sounded like a large plastic container being dropped. Me and my dad got up to investigate. My sister and mother were asleep, and there was nothing noticeable that had fallen. My dad explained that it was probably our cat that had knocked something over. We went to bed, and the next day, I basically ignored the experience again and didn't talk about it. But we never found any signs of something falling over. After two years in the house and no other events happening to me, we moved to another house in the same area. It was newer and bigger. Nothing happened again, but a few years later, I brought up my story to my mom one day, who then revealed that I wasn't the only one to experience strange things in that house. She explains how one night when me and my sister were sleeping in our own rooms, my dad had gone to bed to read a book while my mom stayed in the living room to finish a cup of tea. My dad was lying on his side reading when he vividly remembers feeling my mother get into bed with him. He even said, you finished that tea quickly. But when he turned around, no one was there. My mother was still drinking tea in the living room and me and my sister were asleep in our own rooms. He struggled to fall asleep that night. Another time, my mom's friend had come over to meet my mom and see the house for the first time while me and my sister were at school and my father was at work. My mom's friend, we'll call her Linda, was sitting in the living room while my mom made coffee for the two of them. Linda then sees my father walk up the stairs to the second floor. She greets my dad. Let's call him John. Hey John, good to see you. My mom comes out of the kitchen with coffee and questions who Linda was talking to. Linda says she was greeting my father. But my mother explained how my father was at work and no one else was in the house. Linda was adamant she saw a man walk up to the second floor. My mom and her go upstairs to check and find no one there. Linda left immediately and took a few months before she came back. Finally, the scariest of them all. My mom was watching my sister while I was at a friend's house and my dad was at work. My sister was playing in her room while my mom read a book in the same room. My mom got up briefly to go to the kitchen and pack some stuff away. When she gets back, my sister is colouring with some crayons. My mom's confused, as she always keeps the crayons on the top shelf in a cupboard with the door closed, because my sister went through crayons crazy fast. To which my sister replied, the man gave them to me. My mom was alone in the house, and had left my four-year-old sister alone for only two minutes. This freaked my mother out a lot, and she never told anyone about it. After moving out, Many of our friends told my parents how they disliked coming to our house. They couldn't say why, but said it had a strange feeling to it. And my mom never told me about the incidents, so it was not to scare me. Ten years later, we haven't experienced anything ever again. But we all still very much remember and dislike talking about that house.
Back in 2010 to 2011, I met a World War II veteran who I became very good friends with. His wife passed away in 2012 and he didn't have much of anyone left as he outlived his whole family. His parents were born in the early 1880s and grandparents served in the Civil War. My mother often made dinners for him and we became very close as he spent a lot of time together. He was like the father I didn't have and I respected and loved him as if he was my father. Fast forward to May of 2021. He had a fall at the nursing home that he was at and broke his hip and a couple ribs. He later fell again at the nursing home and broke his clavicle and three more ribs just a few weeks after his first fall. Sadly, that was the beginning of the end. He stopped eating and drinking and died in mid-July. He always had a fascination with ghosts and told us a particular ghost story that took place in the 1950s. I remember I asked him to visit me if he could and he said he would try. The last time I saw him, he said I love you and passed away shortly after. I was thankful I was there, but I think he held on just long enough for me to leave so I wouldn't have to see him pass away. He died five minutes after I left. Now, back to the 1950s ghost story. He used to live in Kansas City, Missouri around 1953 to 1966 in a house that he thought was haunted. If they had guests over, the guests often felt a presence or had a lingering feeling that something wasn't right. They would sometimes see shadows and hear things too. The house was built on an old Native American graveyard, but the ghost that haunted the house seemed to be very friendly. My friend always treated the ghost like a member of their family, so that that might be why the ghost was friendly. One day, in 1958, he went upstairs to go check something in the guest room and opened the door. He got hit with a cold blast of air and all of the curtains were completely horizontal toward the ceiling. He called his wife over, who also saw it. The curtains remained that way for about five minutes before they slowly rested on their own. He left us the house and we kept it so that we could remember him and keep his legacy alive. I would have dreams about him occasionally, nice dreams too, and left me feeling calm and at peace. We would sometimes hear footsteps and doors close in the house, but didn't pay much attention to it. One day, I heard a crash in the master bedroom and the curtains had fallen off of the wall somehow. I put them back up, but I could not figure out how it could have come off the wall. The scariest one was around 3 a.m. in the morning, mid-October. My wife and I were sleeping and she heard a man talking. She couldn't quite make it out, but it sounded like he was telling a story of some sort, something he always liked to do. My wife thought it was me talking and turned around to see what I wanted. She realized I was asleep and saw a shadow man standing next to the window right beside me with a triangular shaped hat and completely opaque. It even blocked out the light from the side of the window. She got scared and screamed and turned on the light. The figure was still there, but disappeared about 15 seconds later. I woke up and she said I stared right at it, but I didn't see anything. Could this have just been sleep paralysis? She was able to move and talk, but I couldn't see the figure. She's always been a little sensitive to some degree. For the first few months, the house seemed pretty normal, but then one night my son came screaming down the stairs in what I would call a night terror. I assume he woke up from a nightmare and it just kept going. He finally took a deep breath and said, I was sleepwalking, I'm okay, and went back up to his room. Then the weirdness started. One night I was down in the basement doing laundry and I heard a small child's voice behind me say, hi there. When I turned around, no one was there. At that point, we started finding toys in the basements in obscure places. My first thought was that the children who lived there before had hidden them in the crevices in the walls. Then one day, I noticed a box of old marbles appeared where I had just cleaned. None of the toys belonged to my kids. I also set up a cheap dollar store alarm system around the office area so I knew when the kids would sneak into the office to try to find birthday and Christmas presents. Little stinkers. They did it often. One day, when I was in the bathroom, the alarm went off. I yelled from the bathroom, hey, get out of my office. 
Since my son and I were the only ones home, I heard him yell from upstairs. I'm not in your office. As time went by, we could hear a piano playing at night that I thought might be the neighbors. And sometimes the lights and ceiling fan would go on and off. I blame the old lighting. The front door would sometimes open if not double locked. I told the woman who owned the home before the new landlords bought it as our kids were friends. She told me the reason why she put the double lock on the door is that someone would open the door at night and the reason she finally sold the house is because of all the weirdness surrounding it, including the piano. After that, we started looking for another place to live. It was during this time that really strange stuff started happening. My kids would feel like they were getting pushed up the stairs when going up. And then one night, while my son was asleep in his room, he heard an old woman's raspy whisper from the closet saying, I'm going to kill you. The kids would see shadows of figures going from our back porch area to a small building that belonged to the old house next door that was supposedly a candy store that burnt up inside years before, but the outside remained undamaged. At this point, we moved. Okay, guys and girls, probably many people have this feeling and ask about this here, but I have to talk about it. Every time I have a strange feeling about being watched, at day, I can ignore this, but the worst are nights. I feel this even in a room where I can close every door. I have dreams which I feel are really realistic and sometimes I miss some people from those dreams, but I've never seen these people. And most importantly, I have strange luck in my life. Once I drank too much and finished hanging above the fence with spikes. Once I slept in a car where I drove at 100 kilometers an hour and ended up in a trench, but somehow I got through it. Car looks like a total disaster, but I made it. I remember when I woke up because I drove through a change post and went down through a trench. Near this was a little divine altar, but the next day when I went there, there was nothing destroyed. Everything was good, like I was never there, but my car was still full of grass and scratches. In other times, I had a bad year and tried to end it by myself. I took some sleeping pills and drank two beers. I think it was just too small of a dose. Once I read something about multiverse, and if you die here, you still live in another dimension and you go there. And also, I heard many stories about some kind of spiritual guardian. I'm very skeptical and know I will never find an answer for sure. But I'm curious if anybody has the same feelings or read or heard more about the answers to these things. I'm 24 years old, and since when I was born, I was always interested in philosophy of mind, religions and why they exist. And I was always a rational scientific person, until when I was 23 years old. Little backstory first. My vision has always been extremely good. Never wore glasses or lenses. Always a very visual person. One of those guys who constantly stops to look at trees because, like many of you I'm sure, I recognize the sacredness in everything. I was always quite spiritual without even knowing what the spirit even is. I always felt also that my sessions of free thinking were guided by someone that was not me. Since when I was a kid, I always used my imagination and I was always interested in the first person experience because I feel like the realm of philosophy and religion and science will one day merge. So since I was a kid, I always used my mind for what it is a viewer. I always felt kind of guided in my thinking. I would see images, concepts, answers to questions I had about society and religion, and so on. I always felt like I knew something else before my birth, but never paid much attention to these thoughts, telling myself they were not real. When I was 21, I finally started to take meditation more seriously, and my exploration into my mind received a great upgrade. At 23 years old, I started to realize that the UFO phenomenon, to which I always felt attracted to, was probably real. And one day, I was discussing this with my family at a dinner. Of course, the members of my family were kind of surprised by the subject, 
because they always saw in me a very smart person. And UFOs are for crazy people, according to popular belief. So mentally, I told my guides in my mind, I said, if you really exist, and I'm not talking to myself right now, that means you can listen to this. And if you can listen to this, you can show yourself to me. Now if you do, I will give my life to this cause. If you do not, I'll get a family and I'll presume that I should do what my human peers tell me. Materialize on this physical plane so I can see you with my eyes or the party's over and I'll forget you forever. Next morning, I was up at 4.30 in the morning. I didn't use cannabis the night before, so I was completely sober. I went upstairs and made myself a copy with the intention of working out. I started to walk towards the park and not even a minute into the walk. I saw my first UFO in my life. It was 5.02 in the morning of the 23rd of September, 2021. And my heart started racing because I knew they were them, my guides. I saw these four lights in the sky flying very fast in formation. Then the formation broke and they spiraled among themselves and disappeared one after the other. Extremely fast, extremely close, almost magical. Absolutely no sound at all and it couldn't be a satellite. I always look up and always know what I'm looking at. After some months of realizations, I asked them in my head to give me the answers of what this place, Earth, is. And they told me mentally, alien interview from Roswell Crash, written by Matilda. I didn't know the book or its title before asking, of course. They didn't tell me this with words, but with images. I found the book and read it and I was floored. I still don't know if these aliens are manipulating us and me and they are actually enemies but they're so subtle and they respect our free will so much that they don't give me this impression. It feels like they want to help us all. In the book they basically told us that we're immortal spiritual beings and that we're trapped here because we are imprisoned. You cannot kill one like us so you can only trap them. In the book my favourite quote is, I sense your disbelief about being a spiritual being. You want the proof of that? Be above your head now. For the first moment in my life, I realized the obvious. I'm not my head or my body. I became aware that El, the alien, is an immortal spiritual being, and so are we all. Basically, according to El, we cannot remember our past lives because the people controlling Earth makes us go towards a light that erases your spiritual awareness. And then on Earth, through mind control and false memories installed by the people we love, they ensure we cannot remember who we are or where we come from. Read the book before dismissing it, as it's written in the preface. What is true for you, is true for you. An Aswang is a monster in Filipino mythology that preys on pregnant women. Unlike the grisly attacks they're usually shown in horror movies, however, these monsters apparently just prey on the life essence of the unburned baby until it dies and the mother miscarries. The scary part is that these monsters are also part human, meaning they could literally be anyone during the day. This happened in Metro Manila around 2011. My cousin told me the old man with the new neighbors asked me if you were pregnant. I was shocked. I never even told my family yet. I was 21 and worked nights in a call center. I never go outside when I'm home and I was only a few weeks along, so I know I wasn't showing yet. How did this nosy old man know? The said neighbors were new in town, coming from one of the more popular provinces in the Philippines where witchcraft and aswangs are still the norm. They were very friendly, so no one really had anything bad to say about them other than the nasty rumor that they know about aswang. When I was about eight months on, I was watching late night TV with my brother at around 2 a.m. Something big landed on our tin roof, strong enough to rattle the windows. My brother and I looked at each other with wide eyes as we listened to the footsteps. Yes, footsteps stopped right on top of me. I was never a prayerful person, but at that moment I called on gods and saints and angels to protect my baby. Then I remembered my grandmother's story about how she escaped an Aswang attack by placing a pillow between her legs to mask the baby's scent. So I did just that. We had no idea how long we waited, 
seconds, minutes, but we heard another jump and then silence. Until this day, I was glad that my brother was with me to vouch for me. I still couldn't believe it happened and it happened to me. Then I remembered the nosy old man. Could it have been him? Something weird and mysterious unfinished, I suppose. This happened around eight or nine years ago. I was in a mall with my daughter and as a weekend treat, decided to go to a local cake store to sample a slice of their chocolate mousse. A few minutes after getting seated, my phone rang. It said my sister was calling. She was at work at the time and was not allowed phones in the production area, so I was concerned it may be important. When I picked up and said hello, a really creepy, really oily voice I did not recognize said, Oh, so you're just here eating cake, are you? I think I may have said a few other things. Ask the name, why they're calling, something like that. The voice just laughed and laughed. It was difficult to identify as male or female. All I knew was that it was really, really wrong. I looked around and I remember thinking that I was probably a victim of one of those gag shows. But then again, why go through all the efforts of using my sister's name and number just for a prank call? I hung up and looked at my daughter. She was still eating cake. The people around us were minding their own business. The world stayed the same. My little cousin, the son of my mother's sister, was born diagnosed with hemangioma as an infant. Hemangioma is when an infant, during their first few weeks of life, has excess blood vessels. This causes a rubbery reddish bump. My cousin had his on his left cheek, which caused a massive inflammation. His left cheek was visibly larger than the right. One year before his birth, his grandmother passed away due to a cancer that grew on her left cheek, literally the same spot of my cousin's hemangioma. My mother is of Japanese descent and is a firm believer of reincarnation. The rest of the family, however, isn't as religious, and we didn't see it as a big deal. We just thought it was someone in a million coincidences. Two years after his birth, however, we were showing my little cousin pictures of the family. We happened to come across a picture of my late grandmother, the one I mentioned earlier. My cousin then proceeds to point at my grandmother and says, look, mommy, it's me. What are the odds of that? Also, when my cousin was two, my grandfather passed away. My cousin lives in the States and I live in the Philippines. When my grandfather passed, my cousin's family came to the Philippines for his wake. We have a condo unit in Manila. We could bring my grandfather along with us there a couple times as he liked playing in the casinos nearby. He had his own room that only he would use when we would stay there. As his funeral location was closer to our condominium than our main home, we decided to stay there the night before the funeral. All rooms were full due to relatives from the US. Since I didn't want to sleep on the couch, I decided to sleep in my recently departed grandfather's room. It was my cousin's first time in our condominium. The morning after during breakfast, while my mom and her sister were laughing, my cousin out of nowhere says, shh, Grampy, my grandfather, is still sleeping while pointing towards the room I just slept in. Note, that it was his first time there and nobody ever told him that it was my grandfather's room. We have a belief in the Philippines that infants and toddlers could see ghosts and I'm quite convinced after all that. My grandpa bought an old small house on a mountain like 60 years ago with a lot of forest as well. As he bought it, there was already a lot of talk about it being haunted. The story behind this house is that a hunter and his family lived in there and he got killed in a hunting incident, which was more likely a murder in before mentioned forest. His wife, not able to keep the family together, killed herself in the cellar. At first, I thought all of this was just clever marketing because he rents out to other people in the summer even though I've also heard the priest talk about this place independently. Now to the paranormal stuff. 
There's a guest book in which people can write how they enjoyed their stay and so on. And a few people even know the legends of what happened up there and make jokes about that the ghost was friendly this night and things like that. But there were also a lot of entries of people from other parts of the world who couldn't possibly have known of what happened there. And they were always writing about the same things. Very, very loud steps from the cellar and outside. Asking if someone was here at that time, a very bright light from the middle of the forest in the middle of the night. There's at least 10 acres of forest in each direction. And rarely, some white dressed women walking in the forest. Now to a personal experience. I've never believed in anything like that. That's why sometimes I slept up there myself. I always heard the steps, but never saw a light or a woman in the forest. This one night was different. I woke up at maybe 3am in the morning and needed to take a piss. I still don't know why, but I decided to go outside instead of the very nice WC we have indoors. As I started, suddenly an extremely bright light shone directly in my face. I ran to my car and never slept again. Before I get into my experiences, I need to first give you a picture of where I live. I live in Arkansas, about 20 minutes from a very small town and 40 minutes away from Fort Smith. My fiancé and I live in a one acre plot of land, quite a ways from the highway, surrounded by trees. We have neighbours, but not super close to us. My fiancé's father and grandfather live on this land with us, but in their own separate buildings. The first experience happened about two months ago. My fiancé and I were hanging out together because she was off that day. She works from a turkey packaging plant and has gone from 2pm to anywhere from 10pm to 1am. And we heard a lot of rustling and movement in the bushes and trees next to our small house. So I went onto my porch with a flashlight to see what's up. I was still hearing the sounds, but not seeing anything, so I just brush it off and go back inside. Well, the next day, she tells me her grandpa heard stuff too and saw two glowing red eyes in the trees. He tells her whatever it was was taller than him and he's about six foot. I hear scraping on my metal roof, which I suppose could be tree branches, but the times I hear it, there's no wind. A few times I've heard light tapping on the side of my house. Sometimes I think I hear voices outside, but I'm always watching stuff on my phone or playing a video game, so I always try to brush it off as me just hearing things. My grandfather has a dog who roams around the property at night when he forgets to bring him in or falls asleep. Fluffy has been barking randomly at night sometimes for a few minutes to a few hours. A few nights ago, I let my dogs out to use the bathroom. I have two leads for them because I can't trust them not to run off. I notice while I'm getting my St. Bernard off lead that my husky is staring up at the driveway at something I can't see. A few seconds later, she just starts cowering like she's scared and ends up peeing where she is. So I yell at her to get inside, which she does and I start taking her lead off when I notice Fluffy race up the driveway and start barking, so I book it inside. My husky immediately ran into her kennel and wouldn't come out the rest of the night. Not even for a treat or my fiancé, whom she adores. The day after the incident with my husky, I again let the dogs out, and as I'm letting my dogs back in, I noticed two red glowing dots through my neighbor's fence that's about 30 feet away from the positioning and I can tell that they're four to five feet off the ground. I try not to freak out and do my best to calmly get my dogs back inside where I almost have a panic attack. This was at 7.30 p.m. My fiance got home about 11 p.m. where I gained the courage to go back out with my dogs where the lights were still there. When I went to investigate the next day they were gone. And that night, no lights. Yesterday, I let both my dogs out again and was out there for a few minutes when my fiancé came rushing out and asked me if I'm okay. Apparently, she heard a loud noise like I fell and like my St. Bernard yelped like he was injured. I got freaked out and told her to stay in outside with me where she tells me how quiet it is outside and how she's getting a bad feeling. That's everything I can remember at the moment. I don't know what's happening and I honestly feel as if I'm going crazy.
This happened around somewhere between the ages of 9 to 11 years old. My mother, little sister and I used to live in another city, but would come back down to our hometown every weekend and stay at my grandmother's house. Bit of backstory. I've always been scared of my grandmother's house, but it's hard to explain as I never really saw anything in her house. I just would always feel this horrible fear in the pit of my stomach, like something bad was around and I wasn't wanted. Prior to us moving to another city, I would stay down at my grandma's house a lot around the weekends as a child. She had two bedrooms upstairs, but had a bed downstairs in the living room, because it was difficult for her to climb the stairs. I would always share my grandma's bed downstairs. I was too scared to sleep upstairs, even after we had moved and all three of us would come down to visit and stay the weekend. My mother and sister would sleep upstairs, but I still refused to sleep upstairs with them. I always slept with my grandma. Never really had any issues other than breaking out in a cold sweat from fear. But this night was different. A bit more backstory that's prominent to the story. I have an older sister who wasn't living with us and still lived in our hometown. She was meant to be coming down the next day to visit us. This is where it starts to get strange. I remember sitting up and getting out of bed in the middle of the night, thinking that my sister was outside. The weird thing is, it was almost as if something was speaking to me, through me. I could have sworn I was talking to myself out loud. I got up and said, Big Sis is outside, and I had to open the door to her. So I started walking and making my way to the front door. As I'm making my way through the living room, I start approaching the front room. That's when fear starts setting in. It was pitch black in the front room, and I really did not want to go in there, as I was scared of the room, especially at night. So I tried my best to stop myself from entering the front room, but I had no control of my body. It was like I was a puppet on strings. The only thing I could move slightly were my eyeballs. So by now, I had made my way to the end of the front room. I unlocked the front door, opened it, stepped out, briefly looked around in search of my older sister. I think this must have been around autumn or winter time because a big gust of wind blew in my face and I regained control over my body. As soon as that all happened, my grandma came frantically running out after me to bring me back into the house. They then started hiding the front door keys from me. Here's what confuses me the most. I've never had a history of sleepwalking. I never slept walked prior to this situation and I never slept walked after. It was only ever this once. Another thing that confuses me is that I always under the assumption that sleepwalkers are never really aware of what's going on. When I feel like I was for the most part aware, I just couldn't do anything about it as it wasn't in my control. Another thing I might think be worth mentioning, although this might be reaching and just sounds insane within itself, is that black magic is practiced a lot within my family. It doesn't help that my mother's sisters don't really get along well and probably all do weird ass spells against each other for their own personal gain. The relationship between their mother, my grandma, was also a bit sticky. They would all compete against one another to be her favorite. So my grandmother's house was probably Hogwarts. The incident has always been on my mind. I've always wondered to what was actually happening to me because deep down, I've always never believed it was just sleepwalking. Whether it's something paranormal, something to do with black magic or witchcraft or just some sleeping disorder that I'm not aware I have or had, maybe just got activated due to stress. For some context, I'm the joint youngest of my mum's children, being one of five with a twin brother. However, I have 12 siblings altogether, but all the others aside from me, my twin brother and the three others, share both the same mother and father. I'm not sure if it's relevant, but just to lay it all out there. As a child, I was fascinated with the paranormal. I fully understood at a young age what a spirit and ghost was, as my nan would talk about her many experiences, and she's not a woman to lie. But that's a story for another time. Before the encounter I'm about to tell you about, I hadn't had any that I could relay or remember. Just some spooky things that myself or one of my siblings apparently did or said, but like I said, I can't even remember them, so I don't think they're worth mentioning. Anyway, I was roughly seven years old when my mum at the last minute decided to take me to work with her 
as she owned her own business, and I didn't want to stay at home with my older sister. My sister was asleep when me and mum left, and wasn't aware that I wasn't at home. From my twin brother and sister's point of view, this is what happened. Annalise woke up and yelled to the top of the stairs for me and my brother to come down and help tidy up. My brother apparently came straight down and helped. Meanwhile, my sister yelled once again, Lily, my name, come down and help now, while threatening to confiscate my computer or phone, etc. But I continued to ignore her. Getting angry, she shouted, Lily, again. And instead of being met with silence, this time she heard me respond, I don't care, and go away. She heard this clearly and turned to my twin brother Daniel and promptly asked what's wrong with her. My twin brother, having also heard me respond from upstairs, just shrugged. My sister left it alone and continued with some house chores alongside my brother. A couple of hours later, me and our mum came into the house and before I could even take another step, Annalise came up to me and angrily said, what's wrong with you earlier? I asked what? Genuinely confused as to what she was referring to. Annoyed, she rolled her eyes at me and said, You didn't have to give me such an attitude earlier. I only asked you to help tidy up. At this point, I was extremely confused. And not being a confident or argumentative person, I started to get upset, as that was usually my response to being yelled at. Our mum, who was just as confused as me, asked Annalise what she was on about, to which Annalise responded, She wouldn't help clean up earlier. I called her name and she was rude to me. I looked at our mother with a pleading look and then back at my sister. You're lying, I said. I've been with mum all day at work. My sister, taken aback by this, raised a brow and looked at me. Then also at our mum who nodded. We left this morning. I remember seeing my sister's angry expression fade. And she made a look that seemed as though she was deep in thought. Before telling us that she'd heard. And why she assumed I'd been home. My twin brother's lawyer confirmed that he also heard my voice earlier that day. I always doubted Annalise and Daniel's version of events that day, as although I was interested in the paranormal, I was still afraid of the thought of a ghost being in our house. Well, the doubt continued until one night when I was home alone. It was 2016 and I was now 13. I used to play this game that doesn't really exist anymore, Small Worlds, not that it's relevant. But I'd spend most nights on this game. I was hooked. Being home alone didn't really faze me, though I was a little sketched out as we lived right next to these woods. I felt our dog would keep me safe, despite only being this little Jack Russell cross bike on cross. Anyway, back to the main point. A few hours into gaming and listening to music, my dog was sitting on my bed asleep and I heard the front door downstairs open and somebody walk in. Not thinking anything of it, I shouted down, Annalise? No response. So I said my other siblings' names, expecting to hear one of them. I shrugged, not thinking much of it, and headed to my room. I picked up my phone and texted my older brother Blake, and asked if he'd just come in or not, as well as sending the same message Annalise and to my other older sister Katie, and my twin brother Daniel. Another few minutes pass, and I decided to just go down and check, as nobody has responded to me yet. As I get to the landing, I hear my sister shout, It's just me, don't worry, and the footsteps descending into her bedroom, which was on the other side of the house downstairs. It was Annalise who I'd heard of. I felt a little better about it, but still had a weird feeling that I couldn't explain in my stomach. I decided to go downstairs and make a hot chocolate. While flicking the kettle on, I shouted, Annie, do you want a hot chocolate? I'm making one. No response. A little annoyed, I opened the door and through the small corridor and opened her door. Before I could even say anything, I noticed that her room was empty. Freaked out at this point, I thought maybe she'd just gone back out and tried to rationalise everything. I went back to the kitchen and that's when I saw something that made my heart drop into my stomach. The front door key. It was on the kitchen cabinet, untouched and unmoved from where my mum had left it. Feeling sick at this point, I tried the handle to the front door and to my horror, it was locked. This freaked me out so much because remember earlier when I said I heard that door open and footsteps come in? Yeah. I thought, screw the hot chocolate. It made a beeline for the stairs. Getting back into my bedroom and shutting the door once myself and my pup were safely inside. 
I went to grab my phone to ring one of my siblings or my mum. And to my disbelief, all of my siblings had replied, saying that they hadn't come home. I called Annalise, wanting this to be some stupid prank that she was trying to pull, as it was her that I had heard. To my surprise, she answered. She never answered the phone. She said, what's wrong? I said rather abruptly, did you just come home? My sister sighed, as if I'd asked the stupidest question in the world and replied, can you not hear the background? With that, I listened. It was rather obvious that she was at a party. At this point, I began to cry as I told her what had happened. She comforted me the best she could and said she'd make her way home shortly and to just stay in my bedroom. Nothing else happened that night, but when my sister got home, she asked me if I remembered that day. She told me what happened when I was about seven, and as if I had just unlocked memories I didn't realise were still there, I said, yeah, actually I do. And we just start to share the slight disturbed. It was after that night, I fully believed my sister's version of events that day she had heard me, despite not being home. There were a few smaller incidences of the same thing. My brother using the bathroom and realising there was no toilet paper had shouted for my other brother or one of us to grab him some. He heard my twin brother shout, okay, and then, well, nothing. And then my brother realised that we were all at school and nobody else was home. He was supposed to be at school too, but was skipping. And to clarify, in all of these stories, the person whose voice had been heard was not home. I've only told this story once or twice, and I'm usually met with people saying that it didn't happen, and that I'm lying. But I know for sure what I heard that night, and I believe my sister and my brother heard what they did too. However, I'm 18 now, and I still can't figure out what this was. If anybody could give me their opinions or similar experiences, I'd be super grateful. It's been sitting heavy on me for years, not knowing.